Let me tell you a little bit about Jewish languages by starting out with the Passover Haggadah or Haggadah. The Haggadah is a document that helps Jews to do the ceremony on the eve of Passover. And in the traditional Haggadah, there are three languages. Most of it's written in Hebrew. Some aspects are written in Aramaic, Judeo-Aramaic, also an ancient language. And the word afikomen, the matzah that is eaten at the end of the Seder, is a word from Greek. But the Passover Haggadah has been translated into dozens of languages around the world. Here are just a few examples of the languages that the Haggadah has been translated into. And languages at the Passover Seder are just as diverse. Wherever Jews have lived, they have conducted the Passover Seder in a combination of Hebrew, Aramaic, maybe that one Greek word, Judeo-Greek, and their local language. What are those local languages? Well, that goes back to antiquity. If you see the purple dot in the middle of your screen, that is the land of Israel where the Jewish people originated. And when they were expelled and for various other reasons, they moved to parts of North Africa, the Middle East, Europe, and parts of Asia. And when they moved, they eventually picked up a version of the local language and Judaified it. So there are Jewish versions of all of these languages that you see on your screen right now. Judeo-Italian, Judeo-Greek, Judeo-Persian, Judeo-Tajik, Judeo-Malayalam in southern India. And the two most famous Jewish languages, Yiddish and Ladino, are actually exceptions to this history of diaspora linguistic distinctiveness. Because when the Jews moved from Germanic lands to Slavic lands, they maintained their Germanic language, and that's what we know as Yiddish. And when Jews moved from Spain to the Ottoman Empire and to other places, they maintained their Judeo-Spanish language, and that is what we know as Ladino. But in the other locations where Jews lived, they spoke a Judaized version of the local language, perhaps with Hebrew words often written in Hebrew letters and other distinctive features. And they might be quite similar to the language of their non-Jewish neighbors, or they might be as distinct as to be mutually unintelligible. But all of this changed in the 18th to 20th centuries the languages that had been in these places for hundreds of years were affected by various historical developments, emancipation, modernization, urbanization, and then in the 20th century, the Holocaust and Stalinism. And migrations based on these events to the Americas, to Israel, to Western Europe, led to changes in the languages. Most of the long-standing languages shifted so that people who spoke Yiddish, Ladino, Judeo-Arabic, Jewish Neo-Aramaic, Jewish Malayalam, Judeo-Median, Judeo-Tat, and Judeo-Tajik shifted to English in America and Hebrew in Israel and Spanish in Mexico, for example. And these languages have become mostly endangered with some exceptions, which we'll talk about in a minute. But new languages have developed in these places. Jewish versions of English, of Latin American Spanish, Jewish Portuguese, Jewish Swedish, Jewish French, Jewish German, Jewish Russian, Jewish Hungarian. And these languages are thriving and developing. Now you might think, well, they're not languages, they're just dialects of their local language. And that's true. But it's also the case for many Jewish languages throughout history. Some were so different from the language of their non-Jewish neighbors that you might think of them as separate languages, but many were mutually intelligible. And that is the case with new Jewish languages today. So how are long-standing Jewish languages doing? Well, Yiddish is actually thriving because in Hasidic communities today, children are learning Yiddish. And that is the criterion for the vitality of a language, whether children are learning the language. Elsewhere, there is little intergenerational transmission of Yiddish, 
but there is strong post-vernacular engagement, meaning that people are involved with Yiddish, interested in Yiddish, even if they can't speak in full conversations. Aside from Yiddish, the other long-standing Jewish languages are endangered or almost endangered. And I'm going to give you examples of this phenomenon by talking about Judeo-Arabic, Judeo-Tat, and Judeo-Median. I'm going to give a brief history of each and talk about their current status and post-vernacular activity. Post-vernacular meaning if people aren't speaking the language anymore, but they are still engaging with the language in important ways. So first, Judeo-Arabic. The yellow parts that you see on the screen are where Judeo-Arabic is or was spoken. And it has been spoken since antiquity. You might know of some famous works that were originally written in Judeo-Arabic by Sadia Gaon, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, and Maimonides. And these were written in Hebrew letters. In the 19th and 20th centuries, there were many Judeo-Arabic periodicals from Bombay to Algeria to Egypt to Tunisia, etc. And there are many varieties of Judeo-Arabic, Libyan, Moroccan, Tunisian, Egyptian, Yemenite, Iraqi, Syrian, and Palestinian. And in general, these were the way that the Jews spoke in these places were more similar to the local non-Jewish variety than to the Jewish varieties in other places, but they also shared some common traits. Let me give you some examples of how diverse Judeo-Arabics can be. How do you say matzah in Judeo-Arabic? Well, in Yemenite Judeo-Arabic, it's mashumor. In Iraqi Judeo-Arabic, yerdukai. In Egyptian Judeo-Arabic, fatir. And I apologize for my pronunciation, but I just wanted to give you a sense of how different these languages can be. How do you say charoset? In Yemenite Judeo-Arabic, it's duki. In Iraqi Judeo-Arabic, hilk, silan, or shira. And in Libyan Judeo-Arabic, lahlik. And they also look different and taste different in those different places. Now, what happened to Judeo-Arabic? Well, in the 1940s through 1960s, most Judeo-Arabic speakers moved to Israel, France, Mexico, Canada, and the US. And their descendants speak Hebrew, French, Spanish, and English. Most of the people who speak Judeo-Arabic today are elderly. There are still some communities in North Africa today, about 3,000 Jews in Morocco, but most of them speak French. About 1,100 Jews in Tunisia, most of them speak Muslim Tunisian Arabic, but the elderly there still speak some Judeo-Arabic. And there is post-vernacular activity, especially with music. For example, in Israel, Neta al Kayam has a tribute to the Moroccan Jewish singer Zohra al Fasia. And also in Israel, Awa, a Yemenite Judeo Arabic group, sings Yemenite, traditional Jewish Yemenite Judeo Arabic music with a contemporary beat. And tonight you'll have the pleasure of hearing Asher Shasho Levi, who sings Syrian Judeo Arabic music in a traditional style in the US. How is Judeo-Arabic doing today? Well, as you might guess, it is not doing great. It is moribund because the only remaining active users are elderly. And I'm using the characterizations of vitality from Ethnologue, which provides statistics about languages in general and is the go-to place for how many people speak each language. But there is some post-vernacular use of Arabic. It is important for group identity to some extent. Now we move on to the second example language, Judeo-Tat, also known as Juhuri. It's spoken in this little area here, which is Azerbaijan and Dagestan. The Jews who speak this language are sometimes known as mountain Jews or Gorski or Kavkazim or Caucasian, but all of those are kind of misnomers. They are in cities like Derbent, Baku, and Kuba. The community has been present in this area since ancient times. And their language is a variant of Tat, which is on the Persian branch of the Iranian language family. It's related to Persian, 
And it's similar to Muslim taught, but there are also many differences. There have been many publications in Judeo taught written originally in Hebrew letters, then Latin starting in 1930, and then Cyrillic starting in 1938. And you can see some examples here of periodicals and books that were written from 1908 through 1991. And in fact, in 1938, Tot or Judeo Tot was one of the 10 official languages in the USSR Republic of Dagestan, making it one of the few Jewish languages that has ever been an official language of a country. But from the 19th century to today, Judeo Tot has slowly been replaced by Azerbaijani, Russian, and other languages in the Caucasus region, and by Hebrew in Israel. Some older people still use it, and parents still use it as a secret language when they don't want the kids to understand. There is some post-vernacular activity, some music in Judeo Tat. We won't get to hear any of that tonight, but I recommend checking the Jewish language website for some examples. However, Judeo Tat is still transmitted to children in one town, Kirmizi Kasaba, Azerbaijan. This is basically a Jewish town, and most of the people who live in this town are Jewish and therefore have been able to maintain their language. But even in Kirmizi Kasaba, all community members also speak other languages, and educational instruction is in other languages. So the vitality of Judeo Tat is threatened. The language is used for face to face communication within all generations but it's losing users. And now our final example, Judeo-Median. Judeo-Median is a language family within Iran. It is an Iranian non-Persian language, so you can see on this language tree that it's not on the Persian branch of the Iranian language family, it's on the Northwestern branch. And there are actually several Judeo-Median languages that are not mutually intelligible. Here I give you just a few examples of words in Judeo-Kashani, Judeo-Isfahani, Judeo-Hamadani, Judeo-Yazdi, and Judeo-Shirazi. And you can see how different these languages are. In the mid-20th century, most Jews in these areas moved to Tehran and other major cities and shifted to modern Persian with some Hebrew words. And from 1979 to the present, most Jews from Iran have emigrated, especially to New York, LA, and Israel. So the vitality of Judeo-Median is nearly extinct. The only remaining users of the language are elderly and have little opportunity to use the language. And there's also very little research on Judeo-Median, so we don't actually know how many speakers there are. So in conclusion, most long-standing Jewish language varieties are endangered as their speakers are all or mostly elderly. And in the next 20 to 30 years, the last speakers will die. 